And now something completely different. Let's talk about performance testing and load testing and other types of testing that requires a big volume of data, a big number of requests, a simulation of many users. Typically, I would be using JMeter or Gatling. Those are the tools that I've been using for 20 years now or something like that. And they're great tools with huge support, massive number of contributors and so on and so forth. But this is not 1999 anymore. The year is 2021. I wanted to find a tool that is a bit more modern, a bit more different, a bit better than those. There are quite a few tools in that area but they are all limiting. I'm not going to name names now. I don't want to shame anybody, which is something new to me. I tend to shame a lot of different providers and vendors and tools, but I'm going to avoid doing that. And I'm only going to say that most of the new tools are either 100% CLI based, and that's not really good because I want to define what my tests are. Some of them are YAML based, and YAML is not flexible enough for me to be able to describe the scenarios I need. So I kept looking and looking and looking and trying different things, and then I stumbled upon the one that is absolutely amazing. And it happens to come from a company I admire, from a company that has products I really, really, really like. And that company is Grafana Labs. Within their portfolio, there is a tool called K6 which I love. I think it's absolutely amazing. It does everything I need, the load testing or performance testing type of tool to do. And I want to share that with you. So let's explore K6 as the go-to tool for load testing and performance testing and other types of tests that require huge volumes of requests or user simulations and stuff like that. If you're not familiar with load testing and performance testing, first of all, you should be ashamed because we should be load testing our tools to see how it will behave once it reaches production and starts being used by thousands or millions of users because that's what we all want. We want a lot of people to use our software. So we need to validate, to test how our software will behave when attacked by a huge number of concurrent users and many people are using it at the same time. So it's all about putting a demand on our system and seeing how it behaves, whether it can handle what we throw at it. That's what load testing is. It is about validating whether our system can continue working properly when under pressure. You know, many people using it at the same time. I already installed K6 CLI. I will not bother you with installation because that's boring. And I already cloned the repo with uh, some sample manifest, sample code that I will be using. And if you want to follow along and reproduce what I'm doing, the instructions with all the commands and references are in a gist. And the link to the gist is in the description. So go and get it and let's play together. Let's start with a simple example. Actually, everything is relatively simple with K6, but we are going to go simpler than simple at the very beginning, the simplest possible, so that you get the feeling of how it works. So we have a couple of imports. I'm importing HTTP from the K6 HTTP library, and I'm importing sleep as well. You will see why I need sleep in a second. And then I'm exporting the default function. Think of it as main function, the function that will be executed, that contains all the code, all the tests that we need. It could be also references to other functions, but nevertheless, that is the one that K6 will execute. And in this case, I'm sending a get request to devopstoolkitseries.com. And then I'm going to sleep for one second. Sleeping is important. First of all, for your mental health, but in the context of flow testing, sleep matters because if you're simulating real users, many real users using our application, we humans do not go from one page to another and click one thing and then another without any pause in between. And sleeping for one second is a good simulation of, hey, click this, wait for a second, click that, wait for a second. So it's closer to what we would do as people when using an application. The important thing to notice here for now is that this is JavaScript, but we are not going to run this JavaScript as JavaScript because JavaScript like Node would be extremely inefficient. Node.js cannot handle thousands of users effectively, but you know what can handle? Go. So here's what 
K6 does. It allows us to define our tests as JavaScript because JavaScript is easier for many people because people generally are more familiar with JavaScript than let's say Go or C or other more efficient languages. So we are defining our tests as JavaScript because that's easier but K6 is going to convert the JavaScript into Go because Go is more efficient. It's a combination of two languages one JavaScript meant to provide easier interface and Go being more efficient at running many concurrent users, many threads in parallel than JavaScript, than Node.js. So long story short, we write our tests in JavaScript and K6 converts the JavaScript into Go and runs it like there is no tomorrow. And you will see soon that actually it is extremely efficient, but we'll get there. Now that I have my tests, this is a silly example. We're going to go through more complex examples later. I can run it by executing k6 run and then the path to the file that contains the test, which is simple JS. And let's see what we'll get. The important thing to note to begin with is that the tests were executed with one VUs or virtual users. We didn't say anything and K6 thought, hey, you want to run a silly test? This is a silly test. I'm going to give you one user. We're going to change that in a couple of moments. For now, I executed my load test based on one virtual user that is a simulation of a real user. And that's not really load testing, but it's a good start. So let's see the metrics. Metrics are what really, really, really matters here. We can see how much data we received, how much data was sent, the amount of time requests were blocked, connected, uh, the duration of requests, how many of them failed, receiving, sending, TLS handshaking, waiting, the number of requests in total, the duration of each iteration, which is one second of sleep time plus whatever the amount of time was required for that single request, the number of iterations, the number of virtual users, and the maximum number of virtual users. There's a bunch of metrics over here and that's only the beginning because there are many more metrics that we might want to use. Think of those as default metrics or the metrics that are important and come out of the box. But there's much more and we can define our own metrics, but I'll get to that in a second. For now, what matters is to distinguish the built-in metrics. Those are the metrics that are built already in K6. And then we have custom metrics. That means that we can create any metrics we want and use those metrics for assertions and the tests that we need or just simply data. And those custom metrics, actually both custom metrics and build metrics are based on few metric types. We can have counters and gouge and rates and trends. Now, if this sounds familiar, that's probably because hopefully you already used Prometheus those are very similar, if not the same types of metrics that we can use in Prometheus. And you can probably see the connection. You know, Grafana Labs that has Grafana, which is a lot about logging and metrics and works very well with Prometheus and so on and so forth. So you can see the connection here. If you don't see the connection, that means that you haven't used Prometheus and then uh, you should be ashamed. You should try Prometheus because Prometheus is absolutely awesome but this is not the subject of this video and I'm going to move on because I realize that I'm losing it. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. So let's try to spice up those metrics. Let's see how we can increase the number of virtual users, the simulation of the users that we are using. And luckily for you and me, that's extremely easy. We can just add a couple of arguments to K6 run command. So let's do just that. Let's increase the number of users to let's say 10, right? Let's not go crazy yet. We're gonna go crazy in a couple of moments. But for now, let's see how we can run that same test with 10, 10 here, 10 users. So I'm going to tell K6 to run something and that something should be based on 10 virtual users. So 10 concurrent users are attacking my system and then they should do that for 30 seconds. And that something is the same simple JS file as before. We are still doing simple scenarios. So the same thing as before, but with more users, 10 of them, and during a longer period of time, 30 seconds. 
And now it's running and it's running and it will continue running for 30 seconds. So let me fast forward to the end of those 30 seconds, 30 something seconds and see what we'll get. And the output is in the same format because I did not yet uh, modify the output. I did not deal with custom metrics yet or built-in metrics. So the output is the same, but the data in the output is different. This time we have a simulation of 10 users, 10 virtual users attacking the system during 30 seconds. And then we got the outcome. So far, everything is good. I have no red flag anywhere. Nothing really failed. Everything is fine. And since I do not have real tests over there, I would not even know whether it's fine or not unless I manually, visually inspect the data and say, hey, the average request duration is 151 milliseconds and the minimum is this and the median is that and maximum is this. Is this fast? Is this slow? Is this just as what I expect? But that's not really the best way to use it because we should have more automation around it, but I'm getting to that, so bear with me. So far you saw that it's relatively easy and straightforward to define a simple load test. We're going to see more complicated later, but for now I want to talk about performance. And performance of K6, not of my applications, in this case of K6 is one of the main reasons why I think that this tool is absolutely amazing. It can handle 30 to 40,000 virtual users. And that's a single K6 instance. So one K6 instance can simulate 30 to 40,000 concurrent users. And that's a lot. That's really, really a lot, especially when compared with other tools in the market. To give you a perspective, with 30,000 concurrent users, we can reach around 300,000 requests per second or somewhere between 6 and 12 million requests per minute. That's big, especially when considering that we are talking about one K6 instance. And if you need more than that, more than hundreds of thousands of requests per second or tens of thousands of concurrent users, then we can run distributed testing. We can run K6 in distributed mode, maybe in a Kubernetes cluster and spread those tests across many different pods running in different nodes. And then we can increase that number to something really, really huge, right? Kind of Google size type of number of concurrent users. But not everything is that simple because there are some operating system level limitations. So you're unlikely ever to reach those numbers just by running K6. You need to modify your operating system to be able to handle those numbers. And the reason is very simple because the number of concurrent threads is limited in operating systems by default and you need to tweak it a bit. You have instructions in the official documentation. So if you're serious about load testing and you want to reach really high numbers, you might need to tweak your operating system. And if you don't, like if you run it from your computer, from I have Mac, for example, then you can reach a couple of thousand users, couple of thousand concurrent users, not much more, which is still a huge number. It's still a lot, but not as much as what K6 can offer. Finally, there are certain memory requirements. I think that one virtual users needs around one to five megabytes of RAM. So for 1000 virtual users, we are looking around one to five gigabytes of RAM of memory. So there are certain limitations imposed not only by your operating system, but also by the amount of RAM that you have. CPU is not really a problem. It's very good at handling CPU. You don't need a lot of it, but you might need a lot of RAM depending on what you're trying to do and how many virtual users you want to have, how many concurrent virtual users you want to have. Now let's go back to examples and one of the things I want to show you is options because I do not really want to specify through arguments the number of virtual users and the duration of the tests. That should all be in the test itself 
And if I want to do that, if I want to specify more things inside of the code, I can use options. So this code is almost the same as the previous code, as simple.js with addition of options. I'm exporting options and I'm saying, hey, I would like to have 100 virtual users because 100 is better than 10 and the duration should be 30 seconds. And what those options allow me is to forget about arguments. I do not need to specify the arguments. Hey, this is the number of this, this is the amount of that, and so on and so forth. I can just specify all that as options inside of the code. And I can just say, hey, K6, you should run whatever is defined in that file. I'm too old to remember the arguments. So let's see the result. Let's see how it behaves with 100 concurrent users. And since this takes 30 seconds, that's a lot of time, right, for watching a video. Let's fast forward to the end of the process and see the results. The results are still fine, nothing extraordinary. My application is not misbehaving. It is relatively responsive. The maximum response time was 300 milliseconds, which is not extremely fast, but this application, this is my personal site. It runs on Google Run. That's actually decent since I'm on a free tier and Google Run had to scale application during the execution of those tests. But this is not a video about Google Cloud Run, so forget about it. Let's go back to K6. The tests that I defined and executed so far were not really good. They were too simple for a couple of reasons. In the real world situation, the number of users is not constant. It is fluctuating, right? In the morning, we might have less and then more users and then less again and then massive amount of users because it's Christmas and so on and so forth. And we might want to include those variations into the tests themselves. And we can do that through stages. We can say, hey, there are a couple of stages in the execution of the load testing and the first one should last for 30 seconds and target 25 users. That means that it will start from nothing and go throughout those 30 seconds up to 25 users. And that's not enough. That's like foreplay. And after that, we should go for one minute towards 50 users. And then we will be dropping towards zero users throughout 20 seconds. So we have those variations. Hey, we increase the number of users, decrease the number of users. This is one duration, another duration. Those are the stages. And we can specify other things in the stages, but for now, this should be enough to show you that we can have multiple stages. And the second thing that was horrible in the previous uh, test is that we had only one page. Test for attacking the home page only, and that's probably not what you want to do. And given that this is JavaScript, I can write any JavaScript code more or less. I will define a couple of different pages as a variable, and then I'm going to loop through those pages and go through them all. So first it will go to the home screen and then to post you YouTube, and then to post catalog and finally to the page with the address this does not exist and you can probably guess that that page does not exist and I'm doing that intentionally because I want to see what happens when something bad happens. I want a simulation of an issue that would be potentially uncovered through load testing so I'm including a non-existent page to the list of the pages of my website. And the third thing that was greatly missing is that there were no checks, no assertions we could not validate whether everything is okay or no. And I'm going to change that by checking whether the status, the response of those requests is 200 or something else. And also whether the duration is less than 200 milliseconds. So the assumption is, to begin with, if the response is not 200, there's something wrong. And the second assumption is that all the requests should be less than 200 milliseconds, actually equal to or less than 200 milliseconds. So let's run that and see what we'll get. And while that is happening, this is a great opportunity to tell you that you must, absolutely must, subscribe to this channel and like this video and join the channel because that helps me a lot keeping this channel alive. I mean, it's not a must, you don't have to do that, but it would be nice. So think about it, consider joining the channel. And if you don't want to join the channel, please like this video. That helps the algorithm and the algorithm helps me and I help the channel and the channel grows and all that stuff. And I'll wait until you do that. Nah, I shouldn't wait. I'll, I'll fast forward to the end of the process. As expected, some of the checks failed. 2,106 requests responded with 200, which is great, but I had 702 requests responding with something else, something that is not 200 HTTP response, and that's normal because 
I included the page that doesn't exist, but I wanted to show you that you can have different types of checks and one of those types can be response status. And the other one was the duration. 2,805 requests responded within 200 milliseconds, which is great. But three of them, three of the requests needed more than 200 milliseconds. And that within the context of this test is bad and it means that that check failed as well. And below it, you have the same metrics as before. I will not go through them again, explore them on your own. What matters is that you can see all the data you need. And if that's not all the data, as I said before, we can do custom metrics. And I think that I will explore custom metrics in a couple of moments. Now, there is one important thing that you should know about checks. And I will not tell you right away what that is. Instead, I'm going to output the last exit code, the exit code of the previous command, which is k6run, and let's see what we'll get. Let's see what is the exit code of the execution we just run. It's horribly zero. Now, if you don't understand why that is bad, you should, because zero means it's okay. And that means that if you executed this load test in your pipeline, for example, in Jenkins or CircleCI or Argo Workflows or Tecton or whatever you're using, the pipeline would think, hey, everything is perfect. Everything is okay. So there is no need for me to stop anything. There is no need for me to send you a notification because those tests were great. They were successful, even though you can visually see that that's not the case. Or is it? In the world of load testing, you should not consider every failure a failure because the situations of having only three out of thousands of requests last longer than uh, what we would like it to be is not necessarily the reason to panic. So K6 has a concept of checks, which are just a visual representation of the results of the failures and successes of our tests, of our validations, but there is a different way. There is something called thresholds that we can use to decide whether something is overall successful or no. So checks are for your eyes only and thresholds is what we can use to instruct the machines to abort, to consider something a failure. So let's include those mysterious thresholds and through them I can show you how and what you should do if you want to run load testing as part of your automated processes instead of just running it manually. And as I already said, if we do want to run it automatically through pipelines or something like that, we need exit code to be non-zero, to be something else. And we can do that with thresholds. So I did threshold section, but thresholds cannot be, hey, if you have one non-200 response, you should fail. No, we need to be more intelligent than that. We need to deal with percentages and averages and so on and so forth, because we do not want to panic and abort what we're doing because there is one failed request. We want to panic when some average or certain bucket of things is misbehaving. An example could be, hey, I want two thresholds and one of those thresholds will be based on the, the request duration and I want 90% of my request to be less than 200 milliseconds. So I can have more than 200 milliseconds, but at least 90% must be less than that. And I want 95% to be less than 300 milliseconds. And if there is 5% that takes longer, that's okay. And the second threshold will use tags and it will apply only to requests that are tagged with the key what set to home. So that one will apply only to the requests going to the home screen, to the home page. And it says, hey, home is more important than rest of the pages. And 95% of the requests going to the home screen need to be less than 100 milliseconds. And if that's not the case, and this is now important, I want you to abort. If we do not say that we want to abort on failure, then everything will be executed until the end, and we will know whether it's successful or failed only after everything is finished. But we can say abort on failure and delay abortion for 10 seconds. What all that means, what that whole threshold means, is that 95% of the requests need to be less than 100 seconds. And if that's not the case, abort the whole execution, stop what you're doing only if that is happening for at least 10 seconds. 
and then within the default function, the main function, I'm iterating through different pages, and for each of those iterations, I'm going to the home screen and then going to that specific page, so home screen, that page, home screen, that page, but the home screen is tagged with the key what set to home, which is the one that we are using in the threshold. So that home screen is special. 95% of the requests need to be below 100 milliseconds or the threshold will be reached and then it will abort. And I can prove that this is a CI, CD, pipelines type of friendly thing that can be understood by the machines by outputting the exit code of the previous command and this time the exit code is 99 and machines know that if it's not zero, it's bad and they should stop doing whatever they're doing because that's how automation works. It is mostly based on exit codes and with thresholds we have non-zero exits if we reach the thresholds and we did. And another important thing to notice here is that the duration was only 10 seconds. It wasn't less than 10 seconds because that's the grace period that I set in the code. But as soon as it reached 10 seconds going over the threshold, it stopped. There was no need or at least the code defined that there is no need to continue running load tests after the threshold, that specific threshold was reached. Now, so far I was running everything locally and you have two options to choose from. You can run things locally or in your servers. You can run things yourself and you're free to do that because K6 is open source. But you might want to consider using cloud options. So instead of you setting up your servers and dealing with the managing and maintaining all that, you can run things in K6 cloud. So let's take a very quick look at what we get if we choose to use K6 Cloud. It all starts by signing up. You need to sign up. I will not sign up because I'm already signed, but you should, especially since there is free tier. So you can try it for free, no questions asked. So let's take a look at how that looks like after you sign up. So go and sign up. I'm not getting any money from K6. This is not commercial. I'm not telling you to sign up because I get anything out of it, but uh, because you should try it out. Once you do sign up, click on your users and then on the API token and copy the API token because we are about to use it. We need to log in from our CLI to K6 Cloud and to do that we need a token. So copy the token and then let's go and execute K6 Login Cloud. We want to log into Cloud and pass the token, whatever the token is. And now we can choose to run tests just as before on our own or we can use the Cloud option and we have 50 concurrent users for free. That doesn't sound like much, but actually 50 concurrent users is pretty decent amount. Remember, that's concurrent, not users in total for small businesses. And if you're not small business, then hey, you can spend a couple of bucks. Anyways, let's run it for free for now and later on I will show you the pricing and you might freak out or not, we'll see, we'll get to that. For now I want to run it, I want to run it in cloud instead of on my laptop and I can do that by executing K6 cloud. So instead of run I'm doing cloud right now which is a bit misleading but anyways K6 cloud and then the path to the file with the code which in this case is CIJS. So now the tests are not running on my machine, they're not wasting my CPU and memory, they're not wasting cycles on my machine, but somebody else's machine, and I can see that it is initializing right now. So let me click on that tiny graph, the only run that I have so far, and see what's going on. It will take a couple of moments until K6 sets up everything in their own infrastructure, but after those couple of moments, I should be able to see the progress of my tests at real time. And look at it, pretty graphs, right? If you like colors, then cloud is for you because you get blues and greens and reds and uh, you know, uh, people don't like terminals. And if you don't, then this is the thing for you. One important thing to notice is that if you run it in cloud, then it will complete the test fully, no matter the threshold. So the abort on failure type of stuff that is important when we want to abort fast is not really being applied here when we run it in K6 Cloud. So it will run all the tests to completion even though we set the threshold and said that it should fail after 10 seconds if things go wrong. And this is arguably a nicer, a better view of the same things that we saw in the terminal. We have, as I said before, 
pretty colors and nice graphs and we have here the list of all the different pages that were executed and we can see that this does not exist is failing with status 404 which is to be expected because I'm faking it and so on and so forth so what are you getting or what did we see that we are getting so far is somebody else runs it instead of us so no need to manage servers or whatever you need to run those load tests and pretty representation of the results now we are not limited only to terminal output and k6 cloud we can export the results to many different places it can go to amazon cloud watch apache kafka k6 cloud csv datadog grafana influxdb json net data new relic and i think there was one more which one is it oh yes that's the that's the is the last export that i know of now you might be asking hey why would i export those things there but you should, because if you're using Prometheus or New Relic or Datadog to monitor your system, you want to probably apply the same logic to load testing as to real production monitoring and so on and so forth. And probably leverage the same dashboards and same criteria and so on and so forth, because load testing is really simulation of what will happen in production. So whichever way we are using to monitor real traffic in production and to get notification when something is terribly wrong, then we should probably apply the same logic to load testing because as i said before it's a simulation of production so if production is prometheus try to use prometheus for load testing if production is something else then try to use something else and try to apply the same logic to the staging environment or whichever environment is running your load testing and production And finally, money, 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 money. You want to know how much it costs, whether it is expensive or no. Well, it's not cheap. Let me tell you that. It's not cheap. You get 50 users for free, but that is usually not sufficient for anything but small companies. So you might have to pay or run it yourself. If you do choose to pay, it's 400 bucks for 1,000 virtual users. And 1,000 virtual users is a decent figure. And if you need more than that, then we're talking about 1,200 for 5,000 virtual users. And if that's not enough, you need to go for more. You need to pay more. But that's the thing. If you're having millions of concurrent users, then you shouldn't have trouble paying a couple of thousand bucks. If you don't have many users, then there is a free option. It's a fair deal. You're small, you get it for free. As you grow bigger, you need to pay something for a service. And services, let me tell you that, their service is awesome. K6 itself is amazing. I love it. And using cloud is saving you from setting up infrastructure yourself. If you're running in AWS or Azure or wherever, you would need to pay for that infrastructure anyway. And you would save yourself trouble of managing all that and fine tuning all the parameters to reach those numbers. Because, hey, remember what I said at the very beginning, you need to fine tune your operating system to be able to handle this number of concurrent threats. So let's talk about K6. Should you use it or should you not use it? What are the pros? What are the cons? Every single time I reviewed something and if I remember to do pros and cons at the very end, which I do not always, but hey, that's life. It's complicated. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that this is the first time, probably the first time that I have nothing negative to say. This is, this is working really great. This is absolutely amazing. There are no cons. Maybe the price, but it's fair to pay for the service. So that's not really a negative thing either. And there are many positive things. First of all, it's not declarative. I like YAML, I like declarative format, but I like declarative format to specify the state of something. That's why I like declarative format to specify the definitions of my applications, of infrastructure and so on and so forth. Declarative format is ideal for specifying the desired state, but this is not the desired state. These are the tests, and I really do not think that you should be using any tool that allows you to specify tests of any kind, including load testing in YAML or JSON or something like that. That's not how we write tests. And I'm really happy that K6 avoided the temptation to define everything as YAML. This is not a good use case for declarative format. And K6 did, did well by leveraging JavaScript. It is easy to learn the syntax. It is easy to create simple things. It is easy to create complicated things. I love it. I really, really, really like that it is using JavaScript. And I like even more that it is not running 
defining JavaScript. So JavaScript is the interface for you for defining stuff, but it is running it through code, and that means that it is really performant. It can handle a lot of virtual users. Second, it is very extensive. You can do almost anything you want. It can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be, and there is almost no limit to what we can or cannot do. So that's really great. It's extensive framework. The only thing maybe potentially missing are additional libraries out of the box, but hey, it's programming language, it's JavaScript, you can figure it out, you can import libraries you need, and so on and so forth. The performance is amazing. I haven't used a tool in that area that could handle that many virtual users in parallel. As soon as I would start reaching three-digit numbers, especially high three-digit numbers, or thousands maybe of users, other tools would just collapse, kind of like, hey, I don't know what to do, I cannot do, I cannot work with this, or they would fake it. They would try to convince me that they're running all those things in parallel while they were not really doing that, and so on and so forth. So performance is absolutely amazing. I like that you can run it yourself, or it can be SaaS. You have freedom to choose whether you will do it yourself or you will leverage the benefits of using uh, software as a service, using K6 Cloud. It's up to you. It's open source. It can be as free as you want it to be or you can pay for the service and that's great. And finally, exports rock. I did not show you how to export the data but you can check it from documentation and that rocks. I think it's very important that we can export the results of our load tests to the same tool that we use to monitor production, whatever that tool is. Mine is Prometheus, yours might be Datadog or CloudWatch. It's really, really, really important that we can export to those tools and treat that data the same way as we treat other data and use the same type of alerting system and dashboards. And it's absolutely amazing that we can export to all the major formats or the tools we use for monitoring. That's K6. I love it. That's my preferable tool. That's my tool of choice for running load testing and performance testing and all other types of testings that require a volume to be thrown at our system. Use it. Use it now. Immediately. Try it out. You really, really, really should try it out if you have the need to run load tests. And if you do not have such a need, then you should. You, you really, really should. Everybody should load test their applications.